Afghanistan is the graveyard of empires. So goes the saying that describes why the U.S. has faced a seemingly impossible task since 2001. But the fact is, the fate of the U.S.'s longest war was never preordained. The U.S. has made many mistakes and has struggled with Afghanistan's neighbor, Pakistan. And perhaps the definitive version of that story is in the new book, Directorate S, The CIA and America's Secret Wars in Afghanistan and Pakistan by Steve Call, the dean and Henry Luce professor of journalism at the Columbia Journalism School. Steve Call, welcome to the program. Thank Thanks you for having me. This is a book about 9-11, the aftermath, the war in Afghanistan, and it is titled Directorate S. What is Directorate S, and why is it at the heart of this story? So it's the covert action arm of the Pakistani intelligence service, known as ISI. And it's the, the arm that has supported the Taliban both before and after 9-11, that has uh, worked at times in collaboration with the CIA during the 1980s war, and then against American interests after 2001, to try to seek influence for Pakistan in Afghanistan through these Islamist militias. And it is at the heart of the war because the sanctuary the Taliban have enjoyed in Pakistan and the support that they've been able to get covertly from ISI has been one of the major reasons why the U.S. has not been able to stabilize Afghanistan despite sending tens of thousands of combat troops uh, to the country along with NATO allies. Now, as you say, Pakistan has been doing this for a long time. Uh, and from the day after 9-11, the head of the ISI, you write, uh, starts saying, oh, maybe it's not al-Qaeda, and you should really be looking at India, kind of uh, shifting the focus. Um, but there was a moment in 2004, you write, that it seems like Pakistan could have once and for all kind of turned its back on the Taliban, and it didn't. Why not? Well, it's interesting. There was this period of relative peace after the fall of the Taliban government in December 2001. And by the time you get to 2004 in Afghanistan, you have a successful presidential election. Parliamentary elections are on the way. A constitution has been restored. Many Afghans have come home from exile. But Pakistan is still trying to see what kind of neighborhood they're going to be in uh, after the Americans are gone. The United States goes off and fights in Iraq, quickly gets bogged down there. And then I think another factor that motivated uh, Pakistan and its intelligence service was that the United States cut a strategic nuclear deal with India around this period, uh, essentially forgiving India for breaking out of the nuclear nonproliferation treaty and building atomic bombs. And it told Pakistan at the same time, you're not getting that deal uh, and because you're not trustworthy. Pakistani High Command basically looked at this and said, look, we can't rely on the United States. Uh, and they're not going to stay in Afghanistan for very long. We have to prosecute our own interests. They feared an Afghanistan that was consolidating its independence and might become an ally of India, which for Pakistan, that's what it's all about. And so was it a lack of trust on the Pakistani side toward the U.S., or was it also that Pakistan just didn't think the U.S. would win? Pakistan didn't think the U.S. would win, especially when the U.S. started escalating the war, and they had, they had to figure out a way to wait the war out and also try to prevent the uh, violence from Afghanistan from spilling into Pakistan too much. I mean, I think you were a correspondent in Pakistan during some of the worst years of domestic terrorism the country has ever known. Why did that happen? It's because al-Qaeda fled Afghanistan in 2001, went into Pakistan, collaborated with local groups, and waged war against the Pakistani state. So if you're the Pakistani intelligence service, your first mission is your own people's security. And one of the ways they've rebuilt security in Pakistan uh, was to push that violence back into Afghanistan, and that included support for the Afghan Taliban, even though uh, those Afghan Taliban were attacking U.S. soldiers, killing U.S. soldiers, and Pakistan was receiving U.S. aid in the, in the billions of dollars. So this set of contradictions and entanglements, I mean, ultimately it infuriated American generals and presidents, but it was built from, uh, you know, a whole series of, of failures to really see the region clearly. And, and continues to this day. Um, you write about this extraordinary moment in 2014, which is a reflection of some of the tensions, perhaps, in Pakistan and some of the U.S. fears in Pakistan. How close did uh, some disgruntled Pakistani Navy people and al-Qaeda get to seizing a ship with nuclear weapons? Well, it's an underpublicized episode, and I hope we'll learn more about it over time. But I came across some uh, really stunning material about these young Pakistani naval officers who had lashed up with al-Qaeda 
in the tribal areas of Pakistan and had decided to seize control of a Pakistani missile ship, take it into the Arabian Sea, and attack uh, U.S. vessels there. And they had a very, they had keys, they had a sense of how the ship was organized, how they could store weapons aboard. They stored weapons in advance of their plan, and then they moved to seize the ship. Uh, they were defeated by commandos. Later, India's government circulated a, a report that this particular ship that they'd attacked contained nuclear weapons as part of Pakistan's seaborne deterrent, nuclear deterrent against India. Now, I, I don't know whether that report is fully accurate. It comes from India, so it has to be taken from a, with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's the first time we've had circulated reporting that terrorists uh, attacked a facility where there were, at least uh, in, in this report, some nuclear weapons. And, you know, this has been the nightmare scenario all along, and it's one of the contradictions in the U.S. war. When we went into Afghanistan, uh, the Obama administration sat around in the Situation Room as it escalated the war, and it debated what are the really vital interests that we have that justify putting young American men and women in harm's way. They identified two. One was al-Qaeda and its international terrorism menace, but the other was the security of Pakistan's nuclear weapons. The trouble is, the more we escalated the war, the more we destabilized Pakistan, which leads to episodes like the one we just discussed. Mm. It's important to, to note, obviously, that this, the story isn't uh, only about Pakistan, and the book isn't only about Pakistan, and it points out some of the errors that the U.S. has certainly made in Afghanistan. And, and one that was interesting to me is right at the beginning, there's, there's a shot uh, at Mullah Omar, the head of the Taliban. The U.S. doesn't take it. Why not? Well, it's a kind of Keystone Cops narrative of confused decision-making. It was the first time that the U.S. Uh, started the, uh, to use armed drones to attack in Afghanistan. They had been using these drones for surveillance, but they had never uh, prepared to fire a missile. And on the opening night of the air war, uh, they sent an armed drone over Mullah Omar's house. His address was well known. It had been surveyed before. They spotted him com coming out, um, and they followed him. Uh, but there was a question of collateral damage and what President Bush's orders required them to do by way of, you know, only not hitting any mosques or any civilians. And there was a very confused set of communications that night. Ultimately, Omar got back into his vehicles and drove away before the shot could be taken. He survived another couple of months in Kandahar. When his government fell, he got on a motorcycle, drove into Pakistan, lived for, you know, basically another decade. That's an example of someone not firing. You also write that the CIA had a burning need for retribution. Talk about how the CIA led to torture or embraced torture and also uh, allied with warlords. Was there a problem with elevating short-term gains at the expense of long-term stability? Well, there was, a, there was a lack of consensus about what the plan was in Afghanistan after the Taliban's fall. Partly, you know, the cabinet and some of the best minds in the military and the intelligence services quickly turned their attention to Iraq. Those who were left behind to make policy in Afghanistan found that they were under-resourced and that there was no clarity about the goals. How would you prioritize security, which required alliances with warlords, over good government? How, would, how much would you spend to reconstruct the country after decades of war and decimation? Um, how would you go about managing the defeated Taliban? Are you going to call them all war criminals, every single foot soldier, send them all to Guantanamo, even though the Taliban hadn't participated in the September 11th attacks and had no war aims outside of Afghanistan, except, you know, perhaps in Pakistan from time to time? So these were essential post-war questions that uh, normally would receive a great deal of high-level attention. But the Bush administration, by 2003, had its hands full, planning for Iraq, and then as that war went bad, uh, it became the priority, and Afghanistan drifted until the Taliban returned. The Obama administration pushed for talks with the Taliban, and you have details that certainly I've never come across. Do you feel like the talks with the Taliban uh, were bound to fail because the relationship between the Obama administration and Hamid Karzai, president of Afghanistan, had deteriorated, or did they fail for other reasons? Well, the, the failure of the talks was partly uh, related to the problem of the relationship with Hamid Karzai uh, during the Obama administration. Uh, you'll see the, as you say, the, the Karzai really blew up the talks at, at a moment when they looked like they might be fruitful. But there were other complications. One was it wasn't really clear what the Taliban wanted from these negotiations. That was never tested before the talks blew up. Secondly, 
the relationship with ISI in Pakistan was again complicated. The Taliban secret representative, this man named Tayyab Aga, uh, a remarkable character, you know, he kept saying to the Americans in these safe houses where they were negotiating, I don't want to be a client of Pakistan. We're Afghans. We want to no negotiate independently with you. You're in our country. We'd like to talk about how we can get you out of our country slowly in a transition, but I don't want Pakistan to speak for us. But the Pakistanis told the Americans, you can't do this negotiation without us. Uh, and they started to act, essentially act as agents for the Taliban. At one point, they delivered you know, messages to the Americans in Mullah Omar's name, and the Americans could never quite figure out uh, what the relationship between ISI and the Taliban leadership was in these negotiations that made it very difficult to succeed. Mm. And, and one more thing about how U.S. soldiers fought this war. Uh, you talk about how U.S. soldiers went blind into battle, to a certain extent not understanding uh, the kind of historic nature of the Taliban's relationship with the people, and also a level of hubris that came from how easy the first few weeks or, or months uh, of the war was. Did the U.S. ever really understand uh, what to do on the ground in Afghanistan? Well, they, they fought a counterinsurgency war at the peak of U.S. military presence there, and there was a kind of a, a fashionable bubble of doctrine around counterinsurgency theory uh, that was applied to the Afghan war after the perceived success in Iraq in 2007-2008. And, you know, Hamid Karzai warned the American generals who were arriving to carry out this counterinsurgency campaign that he didn't think it would work, he didn't think it was the right strategy, and he worried that all of this patrolling in villages and kicking down doors was going to alienate the Afghan people. But he really wasn't in a position to stop the American-led juggernaut at that point. And ultimately, um, you know, the war settled into a stalemate, and the Taliban held their ground. The CIA used to produce every six months, maybe still does, these classified maps with different colors indicating which district the Taliban controlled, which, which district the government controlled, which were contested. And they had different, you know, sort of unfurlings of them at the Situation Room. And essentially the colors didn't shift much. Despite 150,000 international combat troops in Afghanistan fighting to roll the Taliban back. And even today, the map doesn't look much different. Uh, with U.S. troops down to 10 or 15,000, the Afghan forces in the lead. And, you know, there are reasons why the war is stalemated. The, the Americans have an air force. The Taliban have nothing that they can do about that. They don't have an air force, so they can't really mass. They, they're going to get bombed every time they try to take a city. But the Afghan forces have struggled to make really any progress in Taliban countryside. Uh, and even where they hold a district for a while, they, they, they find themselves pushed back. So it's been going on like this for a decade. The book is Director Des, the author, Steve Call. Steve, thank you for being here. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it.